Hello, I'm Scott Clover, and you're listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast. This podcast series is about intuition, healing, and creating new energetic patterns that benefit you in your daily life. In my private practice, I help people heal from a diverse range of issues, including self-acceptance, trauma release, managing anxiety, emboldening self-worth, and creative expression. In today's episode, we talk about sensing being more than just taste and smell, the seven hermetic principles found in the Kabbalion, how society can stifle our intuition, and why the pine cone is so revered across cultures. Enjoy! Carl Munson here with the Intuitive Energy Podcast with Scott Clover. This is episode six of series two, and the man himself is here, the energetic plumber, no less. How are you, Scott? I'm well, Carl. Hi. Nice talking to you. Great to be talking to you again. We have been making our journey through the chakras, have we not, in this uh, series two of the podcast. We're, we're here now in episode six, and I think we're talking about chakras six and seven. What do they do? Yeah, just in general, the upper chakras, the energy of the upper chakras. And what they do is they pick up energy fields and energy waves that our eyes and ears don't. Right. So we've heard it in our vernacular a lot. You know, I got a hit on that or a sixth sense. Well, that's also the sixth chakra, if you want to believe in that, that it's the uh-huh. forehead or the crown, which are the sixth and seven chakras. But generally, it's just more about receiving energy with just more than your eyes and your ears. Okay. And I mean, people have heard of the third eye, haven't they? Generally speaking, the one I saw a meme about the third eye the other day. You um, have the third eye, which is the eye that listens. Would, would you say that's correct? I guess the eye that listens. I mean, okay. I'll <laughs> okay. take it. No, all right, okay. But clear, clearly you want, want to say more about that. Well, I would say it's more the eye that senses. It's right. the eye that picks things up that aren't in the electromagnetic field, for example. We talked about last year how much information is out there in the electromagnetic scheme of things that we don't perceive. And we only perceive a hundredth of the energy that's waving through and around us. So does that mean at any given point, there's a whole nother realm of things going on? Yeah, there's probably several hundred of them. Um, But what what are the ones that humans can get a handle on? And then some people, they see beyond bricks and mortar. They see beyond just matter. Mm. And someone like me, I sense the energy that makes up the matter. Okay. And and it needn't be just you. I mean, what we're talking about here is how people can access this themselves and develop that sense of sensitivity, right? Yeah, definitely. And if you look around in nature, so many of the animals and insects around us pick up so many different things other than what the humans pick up. Right. Bees sense pheromones and chemicals in the air. Sharks and birds, uh, they direct themselves with either electricity or birds do it on the um, the magnetic fields of the earth. Spiders can fly hundreds of miles using one single strand of their silk. It's pretty amazing what the organisms on this planet are able to do. I was at a party once years ago, and this man was just in total denial of what I was able to do and my skill set and my job. And I suffer fools gladly sometimes with that. But this guy was just so adamant about not understanding that other people can perceive more than just eyes and ears. And I said, well, hey, I grew up in the Midwest. If we decided to go on the local lake that was frozen, you better bring a dog with you because the dogs can sense when the ice is cracking, whereas a human doesn't have that capacity. So you're much better off to go on a frozen lake in the Midwest with a dog because you'll probably make it back 100% of the time. So that was my example to him was, well, if a dog can sense that, why can't humans have more senses than just the person next to them? Yes. Some people are overly emotional. Some people are more emotional than others. Well, some people pick up energy and sense energy better than other people. And once you start to do it, you can do it better. Once you decide that you're doing it, then it becomes more naturalized. And this can take years to accept your intuitive hits and to understand the, the very subtle frequencies in which you're interacting. Well, you could argue that it took years to shut it down, and that's what we've been doing individually and culturally, I guess, for for centuries. So, yeah, it might take a little bit while to spark it back up again. Correct. Well, it was shut down by the community at large. It was shut down in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries by the church. 
Mm. and by the religious leaders around the world that said, wow, if we individualize everybody and everyone has these skill sets, which were being developed back then, there was a guy, you know, by the name of Jesus that had some psychic powers going on. Whether that was a real story or not is, is up for debate, but it's out there. Yes. Those abilities happened 2000 years ago. There's books about them. And then all of a sudden they went away. Yeah. Well, they went away because the powers at large didn't think that they could control the people. Yes. Here so we they are. became indoctrinated into religion and dogma and yeah. rituals like that, that really kept people outside of their intuition or disconnected from their spiritual bodies and their physical bodies. Yes. And that's what I do in my work is I connect people back into those, making that connection for themselves. Yeah. And then once that happens for themselves, it can happen more on a communal level. But I generally sense and feel it's going to happen individually first. Well, that's what I was about to say. I mean, that's a remarkable thing that these skills have been blocked, taken away, yeah, uh, barred actively. And uh, we've been thrown off the scent. To, you know, I've chosen my words carefully there. And, and now we're, we're, in, we're in a time, in an age, where that reconnection is possible. More and more people are talking about it. And the fact that you practice in the way you do is great evidence of how this reconnection can take place for individuals and, and our culture at large. Yes, generally, and it's based in self-acceptance. Mm. Self-acceptance begets self-esteem. Self-esteem begets healing. How wonderful. How no, wonderful. the thing, I mean, we do it anyway, don't we? This, this is what came to mind while you were talking. You know, there are these people, that, like the guy you met at the party, who would deny and use science, no doubt, and all sorts of other, what are seen as deeply logical and, and rational means to deny your gift and, and your claims. But, we, but he's, he's probably like many other people who's doing it anyway, but then has to translate how it happens. So like pheromones, for example, you know, we're constantly relating to each other on other levels we're not conscious of and suffering or benefiting from the results thereby, right? Correct. I mean, how many times have you met somebody that you may not have found physically attractive, but you really wanted to have sex with? <laughs> right? That goes against our basic principles of beauty. Well, because you're an animal and you're building off and, and connecting with somebody on, on more than just a physical level. Yes, yes. And that's, I think that's going to become harder and harder to explain for people such that we will embrace the fullness of it, I hope, in all, all its holistic glory. So you're going back to the sixth and seventh chakras then and tuning them, allowing them. How can we do that? Well, as I said, to begin with, accept it mm -hmm. and initialize it with the intent that it's okay to feel and receive these images, these metaphors, these pings or pangs, or however you're receiving your information. There's many clairs, they call them, clairaudient, clair, clairvoyant, you've heard, clear seeing. And you can Google these, there's five of them, but one is smell, one is touch, and the smell one's really interesting, the olfactory clair. I don't know if you've ever walked into a room and you smell something and all of a sudden you're taken back to your room in college that smelled yeah. just like that. And it's such a palpable memory. Yeah. So the olfactory nerve is one way that incorporates some of these other aspects than just sight and sound and Amazing. vibration. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So third eye, um, sometimes connected with the pineal gland. Um, do you bear out and, and agree with that connection? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, there's an exercise I do in my work where I can have clients figure out how their pineal gland is receiving information. And uh, for most people, it's been off skew. Okay. So imagine like a laser beam coming in and, and not hitting its target. There's ways to bring the energy in and have it connect to your pineal gland. And then all of a sudden, bah! it's kind of like the Dark Side of the Moon album where one beam comes in and seven beams come out. <laughs> so if you hit your pineal gland in a certain way or you receive the energy into the pineal gland or the hypothalamus and there's a bunch of glands up in the head not just the pineal gland the pineal gland is more of the famous one and it's super famous if you look throughout our history you will see pineal glands which look like pine cones and the symbolism there in many walks of our lives christianity the freemasons the babylonians angar wat they all have some variation of the pine cone which is essentially what the pineal gland looks like. Wow. And wow. then you get me on my tear with, well, what calcifies the pineal gland in our society? And in America, our water is fluoridated. And fluoride is one of those chemicals that we don't need or should have in our body that really can get and, and calcify the pineal gland, meaning turning it into stone, Ooh. whereas it should be soft and pliable. 
Yikes. Okay. Yes. Um, so maybe filter your water or choose your water wisely. I think you've said this before now. Yeah, I've said this before. In different parts of the world, don't fluoridate their water, but there's a lot of fluorides in toothpastes and, and some of the foods we eat and things like that. It's just not beneficial to put in your body. It doesn't come out of the earth like a glowing crystal at the at the crystal shop. It's it's scrubbed <laughs> off. It's scrubbed off the sides of steam pipes in in a fertilizer plant. It's it's truly yeah. disgusting that we put this in our bodies or or that the government deems it okay. Indeed. But the reason, I mean, it, there we go again, is society is figuring out a way to stifle or hinder intuitive communication. Yes. And the yeah. internet has shifted that because now people can talk amongst themselves, not just in their communities one-on-one. -on -one. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it is. It a, it's a great time to be alive, absolutely. And this podcast is, is a part of that uh, burgeoning culture, uh, I, would, I would like to think as well. So normally when we talk, and um, I think over the last, the last few episodes, uh, there's been usually a song that's helped, uh, uh, something from popular culture, certainly, that's helped with the, with the um, illustration of what we're talking about. Have you got a song in your, on, on your mind regarding the sixth and seventh chakras? I guess the one that comes to mind is Dreams by Fleetwood Mac. What, here I go again, I see the crystal visions. Now you gotta be careful with some of these songs from the 60s, 70s. <laughs> they might be factoring in drug use to get to this point. Whereas now we use meditation and things like that. But a lot of times in the 60s and 70s, and to be very clear, this, the drugs in the 60s and 70s were not potent compared okay. to the drugs that we have now. Right. Like I, I remember someone saying I smoked a joint. There was a woman and she was a model and she smoked a joint in uh, Vietnam once when she was on tour with the troops. And then she smoked a joint 30, 40 years later and it knocked her on her ass because it's just become so much more refined. Right. Yeah. So we look at the 60s and 70s as the, the free love drug age, but it was really just breaking into how to get the mind to shift out of our bricks and mortar lifestyles. Well, you make a really good point there because, you know, there is there is different ways to get to these states. And, and in, in that time, that was clearly one way of doing it. And thank heavens, really. I mean, it's, it's a risky path, isn't it? And uh, we see also, and certainly from the world of popular culture, we, we do see how those taking that pathway, you could, you could call it, has affected people, you know, mentally and physically, and notwithstanding, you know, the, the appeal and, and the revelations they may have had, but it just seemed quite a high risk strategy. And thank goodness we have other means now that are a little bit more uh, healthy, I guess you might say, or, or less risky. Well, yes, and some people really want a shortcut. There's yeah. a lot of people that want to lick a toad or take, you know, <laughs> dr drink some mud water in some village in the middle of nowhere and then trip their balls off for, for three days and throw up and things. That's very extreme. Yes. That's trying to b literally break out of a, a mold. Whereas if you spent six or eight months learning proper breathing techniques, you can get your DMT pumping in your brain and you can go into other states of mind just through breathing or intention or imagination. Some people want to shortcut it using these drugs, but a lot of people don't know what they're getting into at the beginning. Mm. Meaning I have several clients that I've seen over the years that have had, say, an ayahuasca experience that needed fixing or they needed to smooth out some of the rough edges of their third ceremony in three days and it, they didn't set well with their subconscious and they're, they're stuck. So then you come to somebody like me who sees and senses the patterns and we can work through where your subconscious got hiccuped or stymied in, in a process like that. Amazing. I, I, I've heard that referred to as taking heaven by storm. Um, <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. And I'm no prude. I'm not against anything like that. But just know why you're doing it. If you're yeah. doing it as a shortcut, then fill in the blanks after the fact. Yes, very good. And help is available, which is another great thing to know. Um, you mentioned to me this, this something I'm surprised um, that I've not heard of this before. It seems like such an amazing resource, a spiritual resource. The Kibbalion. What, what is this? I mean, I thought immediately, oh, he's talking about the Kabbalah. But no, this is very different, isn't it? And this is helpful in the illustration of what we're talking about here. Generally, when people ask me, how do I study energy? How did you go about becoming what you are now in terms of my profession? How do you see and sense energy and how can I better understand it? And there's several basic resources that I tell them. One is uh, Conversations with God, which is a book by Neil. Donald Walsh, Walsh. Yeah. yeah. And um, the one I like particularly is the audiobook with Ed Asner and Ellen Burstyn. 
they both play God. Now, this isn't the biblical God. This is sort of an energy frequency that describes why humans live and, and react in patterns and do the things that they do. But what I really like about the audiobook is you're halfway in a chapter and Ed Asner is speaking as the voice of relativity or the voice of God. And then it switches automatically to Ellen Burstyn because God doesn't have a gender in this end symbol. And it's not, it's not a Christian God in this book. So it's called Conversations with God, the audio book. It's really great. It's available, I think, on Sounds True and Audible and things like that. But yeah, going back to the Kabbalion, it's probably the one that I recommend the most to people that want basic understandings. And the Kabbalion is written by the three initiates. I don't think anyone knows exactly when it was written. It started getting printed 100, 100, 200 years ago. And so it's in the Creative Commons. You don't have to pay for it. You can just Google a PDF and not feel bad about it. Um, there's several versions. One is long version, short version, medium version. But it generally revolves around seven basic principles. And I think it's interesting to go through them real, real quickly. Mm. Uh, the first one is the principle of mentalism, that all is in the mind and the universe is mental. Meaning use your imagination and perceive the, your world through your mental acuities. Mm -hmm. Because the person perceiving the world, that's their perception of it. It's going to be completely different from the person standing next to them, even their twin, for example. Yes. So the second principle is correspondence, the principle of correspondence. And we've heard this in the, in the communities, as above, so below. Yeah. So as above, so below, as below, so above. What embodies the truth here can correspond to a truth somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, and the, the mirroring that goes on um, in our lives and, and, and corroborates the truth to us, I suppose, when we see it in that way, us, us and the reflection in the mirror. Correct. And microcosm, macrocosm. Yes. They say as above, so below, as below, so above. I say macrocosm, microcosm. And, and notice how often they're signaling each other, how often they're similar. Yes. Yeah. Go this ahead. is yours. The, the principle of, of vibration. This is this is your one, isn't it? Especially one of the ones I I care about more probably is the principle of vibration. Yeah. Everything moves. Nothing rests. There's a vibration to everything. When I sense things, I sense things better if they're made in nature. Yes. M meaning psychometry. If you hold something in your hand and you glean a vibration from it, or you're looking for your keys or something. If the key ring is plastic, I have a harder time sensing where that is. If the key ring is made of wood, then I have an easier time picking up on that vibration. So things that are man-made like plastic, certain chemical substances, I have a hard, harder time reading because their vibration is pixelated to me. I can understand that. I mean, that's part of our insulation or isolation from nature, isn't it? And just thinking about the people who can use twigs to find water. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've felt that myself. It, it's so demonstrably true in your own experience, isn't it? Divining rods. Yeah, there, yeah, there's ways you can make your own. You can just bend simple, thick copper wire and you can, you can actually use your own divining rods. And you can Google that, how to do that. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it is amazing. And people use it also um, similar with uh, pendulums. You hold a pendulum and you spin it and you ask it a question and it spins one way or the other in terms of an, an affirmation, a negative or a positive uh, response to your question, for example. Mm. And that's coming from a universal source. People muscle test. Muscle testing is something similar to that. Yeah. Uh, of course, yes, of course. And then principle four then. We, we're, we're working through the Kibalion. New to me, uh, the, a mainstay of, of Scott's understanding and, and education it, by the sound of it. Number four, the principle of polarity. I mean, this is all around the world at the moment, isn't it? But nothing new. Well, polarity is, yeah, polarity is everything. Everything is dual. A magnet has its poles. The earth has its poles, north and south. There's an opposite energy, identical in nature. And to the degrees that we sense those, they're not as palpable to us as humans. But the reason why I, these somatic technologies that I refer to that I work with, the, the healing technologies, this would be based also in this, the principle of polarity. Mm -hmm. So one of the main principles of my work using them is using opposing opposite energies. So if you've got uh, yellow, I ask, what do you think is the opposite of yellow? And if you get red, then we mix them together and you get orange. Now, doing that simplistically in your mind allows you to release something. There, something is less caught up. So it, in the somatic world that I work in, we call it opposing opposite energies.
right. putting opposite energies together and see what else comes out. Yeah, and that's a stimulation, I guess, isn't it, of energy to 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 introduce its opposite. We see that. I mean, we, our world is powered by those opposites of, of night and day and good and bad, for example. Correct. And if you find a happy medium, if you find a way to merge those two, then that polarity becomes less extreme and people become more comfortable. Yes. And isn't it funny? We find peace in the dawn and in the dusk. Yes. And we find peace in the middle. We find calm at the center of these polarities that um, do exist and the energy is real. And so it's really up to you to go out and find what is the opposite of this polarity and how can I merge those two to make me feel better. Mm, okay. And that's what I do with my clients is I help them find the opposing energy to what's what's blocking or confusing their fields. And then it placates it. It, it eases it off and it, it makes it less gripped. And brings it back into balance. And can bring it back into balance. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Principle five then. Rhythm. Rhythm, it's going to get you. As the song <laughs> says. Of course. Yes. <laughs> Everything flows in and out. The tides go up, the tides go down. You breathe in, you breathe out. The one I say the really easy way to realize the principle of rhythm is breath is life. Yes. Breath is life. And in the course of one hour, you have almost the same volume of air. The matter in which the air is made is different. But when you breathe in a certain volume, you exhale almost the same volume. Now, sometimes you breathe in oxygen and nitrogen and you let go of the CO2, but it's still the volume there is the same. Now, imagine if you, over the course of an hour, took too much breath in and not as much breath out. You would explode. Yes. So that's a very simplistic way of understanding the principle of rhythm. Yes, yes, yes. And the, the need for, again, it's, there's, a, there's a, 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 an aspect of balance in here, isn't there, of rest as well as being active, be restful and, and work with those opposites to create a rhythm within your own life that serves you rather than one that is, you know, out of rhythm. And, and we would know what that felt like. Definitely. Slow the hell down <laughs> yes. if you're hyperactive. Mm. Speed up if you're too slow. Mm. Find that rhythm that works for you. We've all been on a walk or going down a certain stairwell and the steps are engaged to the lengths of our legs. So you have to take like a mini step to get in the rhythm of what. And that's so confusing to our brains. Yes. We like to take right, then left, right, then left. But if you go into some you know, strange stairwell that's two feet between steps, then you have to take a little baby step and then your, your body goes off. That's a real basic understanding of why rhythm is important. It's incredible, Scott, because we want it, don't we? We, we, mm -hmm. we like, and pattern is part of this, isn't it? Correct. You know, we, we, we love to feel in the, um, I suppose, it, you know, it's all, it, uh, primarily it's all to do with heartbeats as well, isn't it? And, 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 and sensing and knowing that as, a, as an infant. But we, we love rhythm and we, and we are attracted and gravitate towards it. Well, yeah. And, and when you notice the people in my healing uh, practice, I talk a lot about rituals. Mm. The principle of rhythm can be a ritual. If you're in the ritual or the rhythm of doing a certain thing when you wake up every day, then your body responds to when it's when it's received. Yes, yes, yes. Totally, totally understand that. Incredible. Okay. And, and yes. So and on the one hand, whilst rituals can become a bit empty and, and just for the sake of it, therein lies the power of ritual to energize yourself with rhythm. Correct. And use the intention that you're doing this ritual for a very specific purpose. Yes. If you add those two things together, the ritual becomes not only placating, but serving you. Boom. Okay, excellent. Everything is in this, Kibalion. This is quite amazing. Well, thank you for, for introducing me to this, and I'm sure others will thank you too. Cause and effect. It's like everything is in here. All the spiritual principles we've ever known are brought into one remarkable historic text here. I don't know if they're all. like I, I stay away from extreme words when I can, but there, <laughs> there's a lot of what we deal with energetically is based in these seven principles. And right. as I said, the Kabbalion, which is spelled by with a K and a Y, by the way, K-Y, yeah. Kabbalion. Yeah, if you look at your life and you look at energy and you study energy, you want to go through these and understand them for yourself. Well, here it is, number six, the principles of cause and effect. Yeah, karma's a bitch. <laughs> I love I love your modern day translation to, for, for each of the principles. So do, do you want to say more? I mean, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it, cause and effect? I think everybody understands that. But do, do you want to elaborate on that? You know, a bird flaps its wings, it goes up. A bird shifts its wings and it goes down. There's cause and effect. 
It's yeah. a rationale. And when people use this maligningly, then they become inauthentic. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, this is a karma is associated with cause and effect, isn't it? And people do use it as a stick with which to beat themselves and each other's. We're not talking about punishment here, are we? Or deserving or, you know, or getting your just dessert. This is just an observable, almost physical principle at work in life and in the universe. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you look at cause and effect, it's everywhere. If you look at authenticity, and as I said with some of my clients, if we work long enough together and they really go through the paces on trying to understand energy in themselves, we generally get to authenticity. Mm. It takes a while to get there and have it make sense to them. But once we've gone through the paces and they've gone through the fire of understanding their own energies, then we basically get to authenticity and, and how them being authentic creates a bubble of energy around them that will placate them going forward. I say the truth is ultimately the most placating. Yes, yes. By saying the truth is ultimately the most placating, if you lie about something now, it may not affect you until much later. <laughs> yes. But it's it's going to affect you. And if yeah. you tell the truth and are authentic in your original act, then you don't have to worry about the lie catching up to you. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Because I guess what's being said here is we have to face it sooner or later. So why not face it now? Why not cop the full force of cause and effect right now and live in the moment rather than have all of that stuff rolling downhill towards you in the future? Correct. And that's where the energy world and the communities that I'm involved in, that's a lesson that people ultimately learn. Mm -hmm. And it's a lesson that people don't want to learn because our society has deemed it's okay. I mean, look at politics. For some reason, it's okay to lie and we just move on to the next lie. I heard something remarkable a couple of days ago, and it, it, I think it was from The Course of Miracles and somebody saying they were practicing no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Is this connected to cause and effect? And, 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 you know, what sort of life you might live if you didn't have private thoughts and you weren't a people pleaser? Well, both of those things create an imbalance. Mm -hmm. If you're a people pleaser and not a self pleaser, you're going to be imbalanced. You've just lost the principle of rhythm. Yep. So imagine there's an exercise I do with my empathic clients or my overgivers, and we can do that now if you want. Just close your eyes. Oh, yes. So just close your eyes and imagine you have like tendrils coming out of you, your knees, your back, your front, and those tendrils connect to your family, your friends, your jobs, whatever. And there's probably several of them for people. Mm. Some may extend farther out, some may only extend shorter out. But the idea is that your energy is out in the world. Now, if I asked you to modify that and say, how many tendrils do you have coming in? Yeah, I can't compute that. So a lot of overgiving empaths have lost this fifth principle of rhythm because they're overextended. Their energy tendrils are all out serving or communicating with others. And very rarely do they feel them nearly as intensely coming in. Good heavens. That's really very powerful. That's taking me... <laughs> I didn't even, I can't, I can't compute tendrils coming in even. It's difficult for people to think, oh, I can receive affirming energy as well, not just offer it. Yes. But if you're extending out maligning energy, then it's probably basic. You're going to receive some maligning energy as well. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. But we're not in the habit of understanding how we receive energy. We're more in the habit of understanding how we project it out. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Wow. Okay. Here's an example. Say you have an, an energy tendril from an ex, an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, and you've broken up for five years, but that tendril is still out there. You're still being depleted by this tendril of energy connected to someone that you don't have a reason to be connected to anymore. And this is, and it's more than that one relationship, presumably, isn't it? If you're that kind of person, I think I heard someone describing it as the red ribbon, you know, about around which you, your whole life, if you imagine your life journey, metaphorically. The uh, red ribbon is a slightly different principle, but it's basically the same. But think about your job. Yes. If you overwork and you work 10 to 15 hours a day, some people do, that's a big ass tendril coming out of your body, connecting to something that's not quite real. It's not a person. It's an entity or a collective, but you're making money for the man. Yes, yes. And maybe the money you're making isn't nearly as large of a tendril as you're giving it. 
well, that's when people start resenting so and they, they don't know why. Yeah, they might not even understand what's going on apart mm -hmm. from a, a little bit of a, an illness or something going on there. Wow. Okay, that's pretty profound for me. And I suspect for other people, mental note made for myself there, and I, I'm sure for others, if that's really shaking you like it has me, go to scottclover.com. Is that right? Is that your, your mm -hmm. website? Okay. Yeah, go to scottclover.com and book a session to talk that one through. I mean, that's a good start to a relationship with you, isn't it? The tendril thing. The tendril thing is great, and it works wonderfully for divorce. People who have gone through a divorce, a divorce with someone who's quite maligning. Yeah. Because that tug of war is still happening. Even if you got divorced seven years ago and you're with a new partner and you may have children with that narcissist or that person who didn't serve your relationship correctly. If you still have a huge tendril of energy, then you're being subdivided. And I have certain somatic ways, as I said, techniques that we can do to disassociate you from that. So you're not having this parasitical drain on you. The other way I think of it is a tug of war. Mm. If you had a relationship with someone five years ago and you're still in a tug of war with them, put the rope down. <laughs> okay. Just drop the rope. Leave Walk it. away. You are exerting so much energy tugging on this rope that the person like a dog with a bone is pulling back. Yes. Stop it. Just stop. Drop the rope, walk away, and notice how your shoulders feel after that. Wow. Okay. I think I can carry on. Um, I'll have to just put my tendrils and ropes to one side for a moment as, we've, as we're working our, our way through the amazing, amazing insights of the Kibalian here that Scott has introduced us to this time. And on to the last one. And this is interesting, isn't it? The principle of gender. It, it's on topic, on trend in the world at the moment, isn't it? The whole talk of gender. I mean, mainly politically. But what's underlying it here is principle seven of the Kibalian? Yeah. So the principle of gender, this is probably my favorite one in that it's not about penises and vaginas. This is about every person has a basis of a masculine and a feminine energy. To use a different terminology, the yin yang okay, or lingam and yoni. Yoni is essentially referring to the vagina and the lingam is generally referring to the male penetrative energy. But get away from genitalia and think more of receiving and sending out. If you're a woman in a job with mostly men around you, you have to become more masculine in the way you project your energy out or you're going to get lost. I, I had a client once who was a very well-accomplished CEO and She's like, why am I not dating? I, you know, I'm attractive, I'm successful, and yet I'm not dating. Her male energy was right out in front of her because she was a CEO, CEO in a major corporation in Manhattan. So her male energy was front and center. Well, then she leaves work and what, goes to a bar to try to meet somebody. And this man confronts this woman with this huge masculine block, and that's not what he's interested in. So we were able to let her realize how to keep that masculine energy when it's necessary and then be more in a receivership energy so you can reciprocate with someone you want to hook up with or get on with. Yes, yes. And, and another thing that this connects with in our previous conversations, this isn't about some sort of ideal or gender stereotype either, is it? This is about negotiating what's right for you to give you health and balance. Correct. This is about an emotional male. This is about a proactive female. This can be a, about any of those sense of balance. And there's one exercise I do in my practice that works really well for people. And we can actually balance the genders inside the body, inside mainly the gut and the genital area, the, the pelvis area. There are certain ways that I can help people understand and feel these gender energies. And then, you know, going back to the polarity, bring the polarities together. Excellent. Excellent. And what that does is it calms the person down and they say, oh, I'm allowed to receive and give. Yes. This is the principle of gender is, are you an overgiver? Are you an overtaker? Yes. It's not about, are you a man with the vagina or a woman with a peanut? This has nothing to do with any of that stuff. <laughs> this has to do with how are you giving energy out into the world and how are you receiving it? And if it's inappropriate, then we'll find that and we'll try to balance them out a little bit. How and this is why people come to me is because I can see and sense these imbalances in their fields. And what I get, Scott, is this overwhelming sense of relief people must have in seeing that. You know, they carry it around unconsciously, possibly. And, you know, they've come to you 
presumably because it's causing them some difficulty. They want they want relief, and they don't quite know what from. And then when you put it in these terms, it's like, ah, oh, yes, of course, that's what I've been doing. And here's here's the way to let it go. Imagine, yeah, imagine you grew up with machismo. Yeah. Imagine you grew up with an over masculinated father figure who shot guns and did all these things that just was so inappropriate to your standpoint. And to be forced into doing some of these things really can break someone's spirit growing up yeah, yeah. and vice versa. If you don't want to wear dresses and your mother dresses you up like a baby doll and you're feeling more comfortable in slacks or pants, then you're going to resent this person. Yes. yes I had I a client once who had migraine headaches and was getting injections into her brain of Botox because her headaches were so bad. We, she sat with me in just one session and I said to her, was there a pair of jeans growing up when you were a kid that some sort of like article of clothing your mom wouldn't let you wear? And she was like, oh my gosh, when I was 12, I bought a pair of jeans and I wore them to school and I got in so much trouble. I wasn't allowed to wear pants for three more years. And I've resented my mother ever since. And once we found that memory and let it go, she hasn't had injections or headaches ever since. Freedom. That, that's, I mean, there's some good value right there. It right. was a very Rosebud moment. It was a very Citizen Kane, what does Rosebud mean at the end of the movie yes. kind of moment for her. Yeah. And those happen often in my work is finding one little thing that kinked your hose and it just built up and built up and built up the pressure. <laughs> And this was a young girl who wasn't allowed to self-express her gender identity. Amazing. And there could be the overcom overcompensations as well. I recognize, you know, not wanting, not responding particularly well to an overly blokey bloke culture from my father and stepfather. So I went the other way to my cost. I thought I was doing the right thing by being not like them, but I took it too far and ended up not doing what was right for me personally. So I guess you can help with them. Um, kinky hoses that are to do with overcompensation as much as repression or, or or stopping short of doing something. Definitely. There's definitely ways to casually walk away from a pattern and, and fleeing from it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the great. people that flee from patterns are the ones that become imbalanced over time. And if you can go back and say, oh, I, flee, I, I fled from that pattern, let's figure out a way to gracefully disassociate from it, then your nervous system calms down. And this can be in a 40-year-old, 50-year-old person, but this pattern or this process happened when you were eight. Well, what if you were expected to only be attracted to a certain type of person and you're actually not attracted to that type of person? Yeah, yeah. Well, wow. You're okay. maligning your self-interest because of a societal pressure. Yeah. And that's I f***ed up. It is, it really is. I think we've got a few bells ringing for people today listening to this podcast. Get in touch with Scott, scottglover.com. I know, I'm very aware that we've mainly focused here, um, as we conclude there on the Kibalion. Thank you for your your introduction to that. But we haven't really touched a lot on the on the seventh chakra, have we? We've, we've been a bit lower down, as I understand it, you know, symbolically. We're crowning our uh, podcast with the crown itself energetically now, are we? Yeah, macro consciousness, feeling what's out there, sensing what's out there. One example I like with the crown chakra, the seventh chakra, is this concept of the hundredth monkey. Do you know the concept of the hundredth monkey? Yeah, yeah I think or, I do. Yeah, I can explain it. But also, for example, the sewing machine. The sewing machine was invented around the same time by three different people in different continents. This was before international communication. So the idea got put out in the zeitgeist and then picked up. Uh, that frequency got picked up by other people. Whereas the sewing sh machine didn't exist before, I, I don't know, 18 something. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, one guy in America and then one guy in India and one guy in Asia all decided that they could make a machine to help people sew. And that changed, that's like the dishwasher or the washing machine. That mm -hmm. gave women so much more time and energy to devote to more things. Mm -hmm. So the hundredth monkey principle... If you give that hundredth monkey a hammer and they start hitting something with it and utilizing it as a tool, then somehow that tipping point of that hundredth monkey, all monkeys are going to be able to understand how to use that tool. Yeah, remarkable. And that's really combining in a, a universal platform of energetics. We're picking up on a universal vibration that we can then understand. Okay, and then practically, let, so the, that's the antenna, is it, of the of the seventh chakra, where, that connects with the, the 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 world wide web of human consciousness rather than the internet. 
Is that what we? It's a little six and seven. Yeah, they they oh. get merged a little bit. They they somehow you could sometimes you can transpose them. The seventh is generally also like divine energy, universal source. As my friend Laura Cam says, Gus, God, universal source energy. Take your pick, whatever you call it. Yep. You pick it up through the seventh chakra. And in terms of an exercise or a bodily awareness, an intention, this is to put your consciousness above yourself. Because we, we tend to define ourselves by our physicality, don't we? This is, a, this is something that is above us, isn't it? Rather than actually in the head. It's around us. It can be above. It can be other places as well. It's easier for humans to understand that it's up. Oh, okay. And this is something I challenge people with that they, they come to me and they say, oh, I want to be super psychic or I want to be overly intuitive. And I'll say, well, go back to the body. Yeah. Your satellite dish can be really big, but if it's not grounded or built on a structure that can handle it, you're going to fall over. So the principle that I like to tell people when they think of the sixth and seven chakras is not to go up, but to go inside. So in East meets West, the third eye is purple. Yes, yes. The coating of color is purple, just like where the root chakra is supposed to be red. Yeah. And so what I tell people is give yourself a purple perineum. <laughs> Bring your third eye down to your first chakra and use the communication skill sets of the sixth chakra, the third eye, and bring it down to your perineum and make your perineum purple. Wow. Okay. I'm getting so much value in this podcast. That's another, that's another plot twist for the purple perineum plot twist there. The purple perineum. It's probably going to be a, a chapter in the book I'm, I'm going to write. Play with it. Take the green power or the green heart center and bring green into your power center. Bring green down into your second chakra. So bring heart into your sex or bring sex into your heart. So the reason why I call it the purple perineum is to show the major transference, but this you can play with these in anything. And the one that's the most striking is the blue, the communication, the throat chakra. If you're not bringing blue energy to your chakras, then you're not communicating fully. So bring some blue down to the back of your third chakra and see how your power is communicating to the rest of the world. Scott, it's been amazing again. I, I feel like this is, this is the conclusion of this particular... Uh, conversation on the sixth and seventh chakras. I don't think I'm as um, in the conversational flow as I normally am because you've surprised me so much in this particular episode. And there's another great example instead of figuratively, metaphorically, or going on old rational understandings of the chakras, there you go, mixing them up and spinning them around in this whole idea of the purple perineum. This is, I think, your unique take on this, right? You have a, an idea of a spiritual truth or something that's beginning to be more understood by the masses. And I, I say to you, is it like that? And you say, well, kind of, but try this. And I think that's the beauty of what you do. And the beauty of your work is how you mix it up and take a, an understanding and then really give it your own energetic plumber twist. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I've said this repeatedly. I'm non-dogmatic. Yeah. I like to help people with their energy and leave dogma at the door because dogma is what got us in a lot of the problems we, we are in, in as, as a society today. Yeah. And if you can understand your own truths for you and be congruous and authentic in those truths, then that Kabbalion principles come a lot easier. <laughs> and we can be freed of this human tendency out of presumably our fear to want to dogmatize and get things fixed because I guess that addresses fear for humans, doesn't it? To want to make things rigid and, and easy to understand. But as we've seen over these last few centuries that we've talked about, dogma causes trouble and your openness, your energy rather than dogma, leave the dogma on the doorstep is the key to a much greater, more loving freedom. Yeah. Bring your energy home and hone it and then take that energy out in the world, not the other way around. Don't bring in the maligned societal energy and try to process it as your own truth because you're going to get dis-ease. What an amazing note to end on. Thank you. Go to scottclover.com if you want to book a session with Scott and make this real for yourself. Thank you, Scott, so much. Oh, it's my pleasure, Carl. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast with me, Scott Clover. Thanks to Carl Munson for the great discussion and to Corey Tutt for the music you're listening to. In my private practice, I encourage people to heal what holds you back and feel better in your body. If you need more help with that process, I'm available for healing sessions by phone internationally. 
Visit scottclover.com for more information. Be well, and thanks for listening. This podcast is for educational and informational purposes only, and solely as a self-help tool for your own use. I'm not providing medical, psychological, or nutrition therapy advice. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat any health problems or illnesses without consulting your own medical practitioner. Always seek the advice of your own medical practitioner and or mental health provider about your specific health situation. For my full disclaimer, please go to scottclover.com disclaimer.